Hello and welcome to Basics for Gamers presents Starfinder Basics of Starships Part 1, an introduction to Starship Combat. Since starting this channel, Starship Combat has been the most requested topic by far, and it's also the subject that I've been dreading the most. But never let it be said that I don't give the subscribers what they want, so here we go. In the first part of this ongoing series, we're going to examine how Starship Combat is structured, how it differs from personal combat, and we are also going to dissect the stat block of a common Tier 1 Starship. Before we get too deep into this though, I would like to stress that this video serves as a foundation to be built upon. I will be touching on some key components to Starship Combat fairly briefly in this video, but everything seen here will be examined in depth with future parts of the series. Starship combat takes most players and GMs by surprise the first time they encounter it. Battles in space play out very differently than what most people are accustomed to, and it often comes across more as its own separate game or as a mini-game nestled within a Starfinder adventure. Before we dive too deeply into the minutiae of Starship combat, it might be helpful to review some key ways in which space battles are different than personal combat. First, instead of being played on the traditional 1 inch square grid, space combat unfolds on a hex map. The second key difference is that facing rules are enforced in Starship Combat. In personal combat, there is typically no need to track which direction a character is facing because it's assumed that characters are alert to everything around them and can quickly pivot to face danger. But in Starship Combat, facing is very important because some ships may be small and nimble enough to spin on a dime, but larger colossal capital ships will be slow and lumbering as they attempt to turn. Playing on a hex grid facilitates facing rules by having six edges that a ship can turn to face. And facing is further reinforced with four distinct firing arcs that a ship can fire their weapons into. The third key difference is that space combat operates on its own scale. Starship scale uses the same terminology as sizes on the personal scale, but is entirely its own entity. For example, a 20 ton gargantuan sized dragon on the personal combat scale would only be a size tiny creature on the starship scale. The fourth key difference is that rounds of combat are divided into distinct phases. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds about that here, but just know that each character has a role aboard the starship and each round is divided into a number of phases that dictate when each role acts and what they can do on their turn. And the last key difference is initiative. We will be discussing this more when we go over how rounds are structured, but never forget that piloting checks that serve as initiative in Starship Combat are re-rolled every single round. Unlike with personal combat, where initiative is rolled only at the start of combat and persists through the entire battle. Before we dive into the specifics of combat, let's get a better understanding of how a starship functions by looking at a stat block. The Kevalari Venture is a commonly seen and fairly versatile ship that is available to new players. The basic stat block shows all the components of the ship and is listed as if it is being crewed with a standard set of NPCs, but the stat block can be easily reverse engineered to represent a crew of player characters. In the upper right corner, we see it is a Tier 1 Starship. A Starship's Tier rating is comparable to a Monster's Challenge rating just on the Starship scale. This represents the relative power of the Starship, and the tier of the player Starship is usually going to be equal to the party's level. Also note that a Starship's tier has no relation to item level, but it does correlate to computer tiers in that each Starship comes equipped with a basic computer of a tier equal to half the Starship's tier. Beneath that we can see the ship's size category and frame, Remember, this is starship scale, so a medium-sized starship is between 120 and 300 feet long, weighing between 40 and 150 tons. For comparison, depending on the source where you take your measurements, 
the Millennium Falcon is either a really big sized small starship or a really light sized medium starship. Starfighters tend to be tiny, shuttles are often small, and size larger or bigger are typically considered to be capital ships. Except in very rare cases, starships each occupy one hex regardless of their size. So a size tiny starfighter occupies one hex, and a size colossal dreadnought also occupies one hex. This is another departure from personal scale rules where a large creature would occupy a 2x2 two two square area. In starship scale, except for very, very rare cases, all starships, regardless of size, occupy one hex. A ship's base frame is essentially its chassis and functions sort of like a character's race or class when you're building the starship. The frame determines the ship's size and starting speed, maneuverability, crew complement, and so on. The frame is the foundation on which all other features are built. In addition, each frame is equipped with a transponder that broadcasts that ship's unique code that is used to identify that ship. The transponder is built directly into the ship's communication system and is required in order to send or receive messages through Trion's drift beacons. Although the crew of a ship may choose to turn off their transponder at any time to hide their identity, which is a frequent practice for pirates, they may not send or receive any transmissions via system-wide or unlimited communication systems while the transponder is inactive. They may, however, continue to use planetary communication systems, as those do not rely on the drift beacons in order to transmit. The next line of the stat block shows the ship's speed, maneuverability, and drift ratings. The speed score is equal to the number of hexes the ship typically moves in around. Just like with a character's walking speed, there are ways to increase or decrease the distance that a starship can travel in around, but the speed score is the base. Note that each ship's speed score grants a bonus or penalty to the ship's piloting skill. The faster the ship flies, the higher the bonus received to piloting checks. The slower the ship flies, the greater the penalty that is applied. The ship's maneuverability represents how agile that ship is. Can it turn on a dime, or is it more like a giant space tanker that takes forever to change course? Maneuverability is listed as clumsy to perfect, but what is usually the most important is going to be the number seen in the parentheses next to it. Here we see the Kevlari Venture has a maneuverability of good, turn 1. All starships turn in 60 degree increments, or one facing of the hex that they occupy. A maneuverability rating of turn 1 means the ship must travel forward one hex every time it wishes to turn one facing of its hex. We will illustrate this when we review the pilot roll in a future video. The drift rating of a starship represents how fast it may travel through the drift. When calculating the time needed to reach a destination through the drift, you divide the result by the ship's drift rating. Therefore, if a typical voyage through the drift takes 15 days, the Kevlari Venture would make that trip in 15 days. 15 divided by 1 is 15. However, if it had a drift rating of 2, it would make that same trip in only 7 and a half days. If the ship's drift rating was 3, it would make the same trip in 5 days, and so on. The next line shows the ship's defenses, and this should be fairly familiar territory. Weapons in starship combat are either direct fire weapons or tracking weapons. Direct fire weapons are guns, cannons, laser beams, and essentially any weapon that you aim down the sight, so to speak, and fire. Attacks made with direct fire weapons are challenged by the defending ship's armor class. It doesn't matter if it is a kinetic attack with physical bullets or if it is an energy attack with a laser beam, starship combat is not broken up by kinetic armor class and energy armor class, 
there is just one armor class for all direct fire weapons. The other kind of weapons are tracking weapons. These are self-guiding weapons like missiles and torpedoes, and instead of being challenged by the ship's armor class, they are instead challenged by the ship's TL or target lock rating. Target lock functions the same as armor class, but are for weapons that depend less on the attacker's aim and more on the weapon's built-in targeting and tracking abilities. Beneath that we have the ship's health represented by hull points, damage threshold, and critical threshold scores. Hull points unsurprisingly are synonymous with hit points and represent how much damage a ship has suffered. Damage threshold is the minimum amount of damage to the hull that must be dealt before hull points are reduced. This is a minimum number and is not subtracted from the damage. For example, a starship with a damage threshold of 15 is hit with an attack that deals 21 points of damage. That ship's hull points will be reduced by the full 21 points of damage not 6. However, if the same ship was hit with an attack that dealt 14 points of damage, all of the damage would have been soaked in the ship's hull points would not be lowered at all because of that hit. Also note that only ships size huge and larger have damage thresholds, which is why the Venture, which is a medium sized ship, has no damage threshold. Critical damage effects are applied to a starship when one of two conditions are met. The first is when the attacker rolls a natural 20 and damage is dealt to the target's hull. And the second is when total damage dealt to the hull exceeds the critical threshold or a multiplier thereof. For example, the Kevlari Venture has a maximum hull point value of 55 and a critical threshold of 11. When a total of 12 points of damage are applied to the hull by any means and by any number of attacks, then the venture suffers one critical damage effect. The critical threshold will typically be one fifth of the ship's maximum hull points. So a venture will suffer a critical damage effect when it's reduced to 43 hull points, another critical damage effect when it is reduced to 32, another when it is reduced to 21, and another when it falls to 10 hull points. And it also suffers one more critical damage effect when it is reduced to zero hull points. A ship at zero hull is not destroyed. It is no longer functioning, but can still suffer more critical damage effects while at zero hull. Once a ship suffers damage equal to twice its maximum hull points, then it is completely destroyed and cannot be repaired. At that point, all systems stop functioning and the hull is compromised. The crew might initially survive, but without protection, they're not going to survive out in the vacuum of space very long. We will discuss how critical damage effects function during part five of this series, which is all about starship attacks and the gunner roll. The next line displays information about the ship's shields. Here we see the Kevlari Venture is equipped with a basic 20 shield generator. All shield generators are listed with a number that represents the total number of shield points provided. In this case, the Venture has 20 total shield points. In the parentheses next to it, we see how the total number of shield points are assigned to the ship's four arcs. In this case, they are evenly divided with five shield points per arc. No single arc can be assigned fewer than 10% of that ship's total shield points at the start of combat or when shields are rebalanced during combat. When a starship is hit with an attack, the damage is first reduced by the number of shield points in the arc the attack hit and any excess is applied to the ship's hull, provided that number exceeds its damage threshold, and the shield points of that arc are reduced by the amount of damage that they absorbed. For example, a Kevlari Venture is attacked on its starboard side. The attack deals 4 points of damage, resulting in no damage to the hull, 
but reduces its starboard shoot points from 5 to 1. And if that attack had instead dealt 7 points of damage, it would lose 2 hull points and would have 0 shield points remaining in the starboard arc. Beneath the shields we have all of the starship's weapons. You will notice that they are listed by firing arc, with turrets able to fire into any of the four arcs. You'll also see listed the weapon's damage, but what you will not find here are any attack bonuses. Instead of an attack bonus for each weapon, towards the bottom of the stat block in the crew section you'll find the gunnery bonus for that ship's gunners. The stock NPC Kevlar Adventure has two weapons and two gunners who can fire their weapon with a bonus of plus five. And below the weapons, we have all of the core components and expansions that make up the ship. This listing starts with the ship's power core and the number of PCUs or power core units it provides. All systems on a starship require power and consumes a set number of PCUs in order to function. The Kevlar Adventures power core provides a budget of 100 PCU that can be spent to power its many components. The drift engine listing feels a little redundant, but it displays the type of drift engine that is installed. The systems heading shows all of the ship's major systems. Basically anything not already mentioned that factors into the cost of the starship and its PCU consumption. Here we see that Ventures have a basic computer, which again all ships get for free, so this is nothing special. It also has budget mid-range sensors. Sensors allow the starship to see the space around it and sometimes apply a bonus or a penalty to science officer skill checks. And we will examine this in much greater detail in our future video that goes over the science officer role. The ship also has common quality crew quarters, Mark III armor and Mark I defenses. Armor protects a ship from direct fire weapons and increases its armor class, while defenses are countermeasures that protect against tracking weapons by increasing the ship's target lock score and also increase the DC of any attempt to scan the ship by the same amount. Both the armor and defenses have already been factored into the stat blocks, armor class, and target lock scores. Expansion bays are essentially empty rooms aboard the ship that can be customized for a variety of uses. By default, all expansion bays are cargo holds that may be remodeled into different functions. As a medium-sized exploration vessel, Kevlar Adventures come with four available expansion bays, one of which has been turned into a physical science lab, and the other three remain as cargo holds. Each expansion bay may be dedicated to a single purpose. For example, an expansion bay may be remodeled to house either six escape pods or two lifeboats, but could not be remodeled to hold three escape pods and one lifeboat. It must be either wholly dedicated to one or the other. The last line before the crew section lists the modifiers, both bonuses and penalties that the ship applies to crew skill checks. In this case, someone piloting a Kevlar Adventure adds plus two to their pilot checks, plus one for a base speed of six, and another plus one for having good maneuverability. This is already factored into the skills listed below, but is handy for calculating skills when players take control of a starship. Complement lists the total number of crew aboard the starship, which is further illustrated in the section titled Crew Beneath It. This section is broken up by the five roles available aboard a starship and lists each of their relevant skills, ranks, and bonuses. The standard Kevlar Adventure has two gunners and one person for each of the remaining four roles for a total of six crew members aboard. In this video we provided a brief overview of starship combat that will be built upon over the rest of this series. We started by discussing the key differences between starship combat and personal combat. First, starship combat is played on a hex grid instead of one inch squares. This facilitates the second key difference, which is that facing matters in starship battles 
and the use of hexes provides starships with six different facings that they can use. The third key difference is starships operate on their own scale, which is much larger than personal scale. The fourth key difference is starship combat is divided into phases, and each phase dictates when players can act and what they can do depending on the role they assume aboard their ship. This will be further discussed in the next part of this series. And the last key difference is that initiative is re-rolled during every round of starship combat. Again, this will be discussed further in part two, but it's worth reinforcing because it may be the mistake I see being made the most often. After reviewing the key differences, we dissected the stat block of a typical starship that players may use starting at first level. I'm not going to repeat all of that detail here, but a few important takeaways are that a starship's tier is synonymous with its challenge rating, speed shows how many hexes it can move, and maneuverability shows how many hexes forward it must move in order to turn one facing of its hex. Defenses are measured by armor class and target lock scores. Direct fire weapons, like guns, are contested by armor class, and tracking weapons, like missiles and torpedoes, are contested by target lock. Hull points perform the function of hit points for a starship. Damage threshold is the minimum amount of damage that must be dealt in a single attack after shields in order to reduce hull points. Only ships of size huge or larger have damage thresholds. Critical threshold is the total amount of damage from cumulative attacks that must be dealt to apply a critical damage effect. This repeats for every multiple of the critical threshold and critical damage effects may also be applied by rolling a natural 20 on gunnery checks. A ship's total shield points are divided and assigned to the ship's four arcs. This is ablative protection that some people think of as stamina points for starships, in that shield points are consumed by damage first, and whatever is left over is then applied to the hull. Each ship has a power core that supplies a budget of power core units or PCUs to all of the features aboard a starship, and expansion bays are available for customization. Unused expansion bays serve as cargo holds. Starship combat is far too complex to try and tackle entirely in only one video, but this video has served to provide some general awareness of how space battles work and the key ways in which it is different from personal combat. Everything that you have seen in this video will be explored in much greater depth with the future videos of this series. Part 2 explores the different roles that players may assume while aboard a starship, as well as giving an overview of how rounds are structured with distinct phases. With that, we'll bring this video to a close. If you found this video helpful, please give us a like, and don't forget to click that subscribe button and bell so you don't miss out on our future videos. Leave us a comment letting us know what topics you would like to see us cover in the future, and we can always be reached through our Twitter and Facebook pages too. If you would like to use some of the maps that we feature in our videos with your own games, you can find them at Maps of Mastery and Zero Hour. Links to those sites may be found in the description. Thanks for watching, take care, and we'll see you soon with more basics for your favorite tabletop games.